On the 11th of October 2015, Josh Hansen went for a drink at a bar in West London and was stabbed to death. His killer was a 31-year-old man called Shane O'Brien, who evaded police for three and a half years. Detective Chief Inspector Noel McHugh takes up the story. Did you see uh, Josh is in the bar with uh, his girlfriend and with friends? And Shane O'Brien is with his group. Towards the end of the evening, Shane O'Brien stands up and he uses words to the effect of, what's your problem? At which point you can see Josh is really quite surprised, shocked. And uh, Shane O'Brien has reached into his pocket. He's taken out a Stanley knife and um, he's cut Josh from his ear across to his chest. He then turns around and calmly walks out of the bath and we would see that he was drinking from beakers. We recover fingerprints. We know it's Shane O'Brien. He was wearing a Canada Goose jacket. But on that jacket, there were spots of blood that were Josh's blood. Shane O'Brien later boarded a private jet, left the country and became one of Britain's most wanted fugitives. Earlier this year, police tracked him down in Romania and brought him back to the UK to face justice. On Wednesday, he was given a life sentence at the Old Bailey. Throughout this entire time, Josh's family fought to raise awareness of the case to keep pressure on the authorities looking for his killer and to keep pressure on O'Brien to return. We have spoken to Josh's mum, Tracy, and his sister, Brooke, a few times on the programme, and I'll be speaking to them again in a minute. But first, here's a clip of the first time they came on the show months after Josh's death, when Tracy started by explaining what happened on the night her son died. Uh, in the early hours of Sunday morning, on the 11th of October, Josh was with his girlfriend um, for a very short period of time um, when he was stabbed in the neck. I received a phone call in the early hours of the morning to tell me that Josh had been stabbed and Brooke and I made our way to the Ari Bar in East Coates. And that was confirmed to us by the police officers there. Um, total shock, total dismay, um, overwhelmed, obviously, um, trying to process that information. And then finding out three days later that um, there was a suspect that the police would like to speak to in connection with Josh's murder. And since that day, really, we have been sharing our grief alongside a murder investigation. And we're here today to ask for public to come forward if they know anything, anyone, anywhere, who may have any information as to the whereabouts of Shane O'Brien or indeed himself, to make contact with the police. Well, Tracy and Brooke are here with me now. Welcome. Um, that was just a few months after Josh's murder. And yeah. when you started watching that just then, you, I heard you say to yourself, that just feels like yesterday. Yeah, it absolutely does. It's quite surreal watching myself back mm. um, and, you know, trying to connect with how I felt back then, um, which is desperate, you know, pleading for help, any kind of help that we could get that would get, get us justice. And as you know, it's taken four years to get there mm. and it's been nothing short of a living nightmare. And do you feel that if you hadn't have pursued things in the way that you did, I mentioned that you've been on this program several times because obviously you wanted to keep pressure up, keep momentum going. Do you feel that if you hadn't have done that, things might have been different? I've got no doubt in my mind whatsoever. And that's not me just saying, oh, I've done this, you know, we've done that. Um, it was, it's feedback that I've had um, from, indeed, uh, the lead on the case, uh, DCI Noel McHugh, his team, um, National Crime Agency, um, lots of other people have, have given us some very positive feedback. I just knew that we had to do something to help assist the police and to make sure that um, what happened to Josh didn't go away. Mm. And, you know, we will do whatever we can to help others on this journey, you know, if, if they find themselves on this journey, or those that still don't have justice, to do exactly that as well. Mm. Shane O'Brien actually said in court, it, it emerged in court, that he had seen interviews that you gave, didn't he? He said in court that, uh, or his, his defence barrister said in court that um, 
Oh, no, actually, it was him who said it, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Yes, mm. you're right. He said it um, that, you know, having seen my appeal with Brooke, mm. our appeal, um, that made him want to get in touch. How did that make you feel then, Brooke? Um, it's really hard when you're um, in the courtroom um, and you're going through the trial. Every day is really challenging. And it's actually really, really scary sitting there um, with the, the, the person who took your loved one's life. Um, even saying their name is really difficult to cope with. Um, and it's quite, again, it's very, it's close to home, especially when he mentions mum's name in the interview um, and the appeals. And it's quite, um, it makes you feel quite angry as well that someone who's been on the run for three and a half years is actually sitting there watching us on TV. Uh, yeah, it's quite a surreal feeling, really. Yeah, how, how did you feel about it, Tracy? <sighs> um, I mean, it was... Sh before he said that, he just kept referring to Josh as Josh, which I found really, really difficult to take mm -hmm. on board. You know, much preferred him to refer to my son as Mr Hanson. Mm -hmm. um, he wasn't a friend of him, he didn't know him, they'd never met before. Mm -hmm. And then to sort of lead with that, then to mention me as well, it was, it was almost trying to, I don't know, um, if it was for the benefit of the jury, but to, to sort of maybe personalise and humanise the situation, which there's no way, mm -hmm. you know, th that that could actually happen. And thank goodness for, for the jury, um, who obviously have to reach a, a, a verdict based on the evidence that is, is brought to them and what they see. And obviously, we've, you've shown the CCC, CCTV this morning. Uh, it, it, speaks for itself, it speaks for itself, so... Yeah, it was, it, as Brooke said, it's very hard to sit in that environment where you have to maintain your emotions. You have to, you just cannot speak. You cannot show any, you know, n no emotion whatsoever. You don't want to be accused of swaying the jury or trying to intimidate the defendant. Um, we, we chose to sit way back, actually, so that we, we could never be accused of that because mm -hmm. so many other families who've been through this process have indeed been accused of those kind of things, which is horrific. Mm. He's been given a life sentence, he'll serve a minimum 26 years. Mm -hmm. It's only just happened, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm sure it'll take some time for yeah. that to, to settle in for you. But how does that feel now for you, knowing he is behind bars? Um, well, obviously, we have a sense of relief. Mm -hmm. um, we can grieve for Josh in peace. Mm -hmm. That's something that's been denied to us for four years. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of adjust adjustments to take place. But it means that also this person cannot cause any more harm to law-abiding citizens, innocent people. Josh was just 21, out with his friends, you know, just enjoying a night out. Well, actually, he hadn't even met, got into it. He was only in there 15 minutes. Um, so it's kind of bittersweet as well, because there's no length of time that will actually um, be enough. Well, there would actually, and that would be a whole lifetime. Um, and that whole life term to be spent, you know, going through processes of re rehabilitation, um, doing whatever the government would deem fit for an individual to do to, to give back to society in a positive way. Um, so for us, really, mm. and I think you agree, don't you, Brooke? Yeah. Um, Josh would be 25 now. Um, you know, Shane O'Brien has been sentenced 26 years. It's one year short. I mean, Josh will be 26 in February. Uh, would have been 26 in February. Um, so really, does my son's life just equate to one year in prison per year? Um, yeah, it's bittersweet, but, you know, yeah, sense of relief, mm. nonetheless. And Brooke, for you, how do you feel about your brother's killer now? Um, it's hard to um, kind of get his face out of my head every day anyway. Um, and again, like we've always said, for the rest of our lives and for the rest of my children's lives, grandchildren, um, that Josh is always going to be associated with Shane O'Brien, which is really, really difficult. Um, but, you know, we've got the message out there. We, we put the CCTV out there. We agreed for it to be out there for innocent people and parents and siblings um, to watch the CCTV. It's horrendous. Um, but. I'm glad everybody knows without question now that Josh was a young, innocent man mm -hmm. and it can happen. It took five seconds, didn't even have the opportunity, he didn't even know what was coming his way. So for someone like Shane O'Brien to be off the streets, it's another innocent person that can go home in the evening to their family. 
And you've been campaigning ever since for um, better awareness of the impact of knives on young lives. What for you, Tracy, would be the legacy that might come out of this, if, if that's how you can look at it? You no, know, dare I say it, but we've had um, some very, very moving success stories already. Mm -hmm. You know, we have lots of young people who've reached out to us to say, you know, because of Josh, um, because of what, because we share Josh's story in schools, um, and over a, a three-week period uh, a couple of months ago, four and a half thousand young people got to know Josh. Mm -hmm. And we've had feedback, lots of feedback from that, from teachers and from pupils, um, just to say that, you know, you have made a massive impact on our lives. And Josh has, you know, they're mm -hmm. crying for Josh, not for us. We're there to tell Josh's story. This is Josh's story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we can raise awareness to, you know, the, the, the devastation that knife crime is having on innocent people. And this isn't a gang thing, you know, I think the government and the media, the press, we need, it need, this needs to stop. You know, we need to look at it objectively. Um, it can't just fit into a box. It's not one size fits all. This can happen to anybody. Um, and I think that's what we need to do. We need to change some of the policies that are in place at the moment in, in Parliament as well. We need a victim's law. We don't have one. So victims get very little support. Um, and, you know, there needs to be a lot more intervention and prevention happening out there. Thank you both very much. As no, I say, you've been here several us. times. I'm glad that it's resolved. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very Thank much. You.